Welcome to Common Cause's 50th anniversary celebration. We are so happy you are able to join us tonight as we celebrate the past 50 years and look ahead to the next 50 years. Please welcome Common Cause National Governing Board Chair, Martha Tierney, and Vice Chair, Nancy Ratson. Hello and welcome. As Chair of the Common Cause National Governing Board, I am honored and excited to be here and to greet all of you joining us for the kickoff of our 50th anniversary celebration. Thank you. 50 years ago, Common Cause was conceived of and founded by John Gardner and one employee, Roger Craver, to take on the task of holding those in government accountable to the people who put them there. A seemingly daunting undertaking that over time has become a part of the very fabric of our democracy questioning abuses of power, shining a light on self-serving public actors and actions, exposing violations of due process, moving reforms to create more transparency, and always providing a platform for the voices, perspectives, and participation of all people. And now we gather to remember and celebrate those whose dedication and determination have delivered us to a point in time for this remarkable and resilient democracy where the work of Common Cause matters just as much as it did in John Gardner's days. From election protection to money in politics to redistricting and much more, the passion and patriotism of Common Cause and all who join with us have a vital role to play today and into tomorrow. Over the next 50 years, we must ensure that every vote counts and is counted, that elect officials are responsive to their constituents and not to their campaign donors alone, that equity in all things is absolute, and that we celebrate a government defined and designed by the people and not the special interests. Thank you again for your support, championship, and for being a part of our incredible common cause. Thank you for joining tonight from communities across the nation for the kickoff of our 50th anniversary. There is much to celebrate, both as we look back over the past five decades on the leadership and impact of Common Cause, and as we move forward and continue our essential work of creating an enduring democracy that works for all. For me, and for many of you, no doubt, these last 18 months have painfully exposed the fragility of our republic, as well as its failure to meet the core promise of democracy, the promise of inclusion, fairness, and equity for all. This time has also reinforced the vision and value of common cause, and most potently, our essential power to deliver a movement of citizens that demand and will work relentlessly to actualize bold, inclusive solutions and truly equitable structures of democracy that lift and serve us all. You are that movement. You are what ensures me that common cause, that we the people of common cause will help make real the promise of true democracy for all. I know this because I've seen you in action Notwithstanding a worldwide pandemic, our extraordinary staff and our 1.2 million members across the country adapted quickly and acted responsively. At every turn, you delivered your voice and your power through Common Cause to safeguard and defend our democracy from assaults and to protect the most precious right of a democracy, a safe, accessible, fair election. You helped our nation stay focused on the fundamental promise that every individual in every community across this country counts and must be counted. There is still much work to be done to repair and heal this nation and meet the promise of equity for all. In his final message, the late Congressman John Lewis wrote, the truth is still marching on Thank you for your unwavering commitment to keep the truth and democracy marching on. Please welcome Chair of the Common Cause Connecticut Advisory Board and National Governing Board Member, Dr. Bilal Sekou. 
This is a moment 50 years in the making, and I'm so honored to be here with each of you tonight. I'm especially eager to talk with you about something near and dear to my heart, something that truly makes Common Cause unique. I'm talking, of course, about the impressive ground level work being done by Common Cause in our states and local communities. It's well known that Common Cause is a powerful actor on the national stage, but it's the network of state offices that truly make Common Cause a national powerhouse. And that's what attracted me to Common Cause right from the start. I was inspired by the victories already won. Reforms like establishing open meetings and public records laws, campaign finance reform, sweeping ethics reform, small dollar public financing, and more accessible voting laws. And I could see the limitless potential of a coordinated local and national strategy. It was the perfect recipe to deliver people-powered results that I know are the key to delivering on our democracy's promise to all Americans. I wanted to be a part of it. That's why I joined the Advisory Board of Common Cause in Connecticut in 2009 and later became chair of the state board and now I'm a member of the Common Cause National Governing Board. In my home state of Connecticut, we crafted, fought for, won, and continue to expand and defend citizens' financing of elections. And I'm pleased to report that just last month, we succeeded in a decade-long battle to stop prison-based gerrymandering. In Connecticut and all across the country, our growing focus on delivering social and racial justice and increasing the political participation of African Americans has been emotional and energizing. The past year has opened many Americans' eyes for the first time to the injustices that so many people in this country face on a daily basis. But people are also learning they can and must do something to bring about positive change. More and more Americans are waking up to the fact that the power and responsibility to bring about key reforms to our police and justice system lie within our communities. They understand that our elections depend on us speaking out against voter suppression laws and racial and partisan gerrymandering. They understand that we need to build a multiracial inclusive democracy where everyone has a voice and an ability to participate, not just by voting, but in the governance of our society. This is a turning point moment. And whether we truly realize that democracy based on our ideals depends on our ability to demand and win solutions at the state and local levels. But enough talk, let's see it in action. I think the young people you are about to meet will give you great hope for the future of our democracy and energize you for all the work yet to come. Thank you and enjoy. Good evening. My name is Gavin Johnson and I'm a junior at Charleston High School in Charleston, Illinois. Charleston, Illinois is a small rural college town with a large agricultural presence. Rural communities like mine can sometimes be some of the hardest to count for the census. I decided that I wanted to volunteer last year to help get out the count with this knowledge in mind. Through my research, I found that Common Cause Illinois was one of the organizations working on this crucial issue. As soon as they reached out to Common Cause Illinois, they put me to work. I began by calling hundreds of people throughout Illinois, asking them to complete the census. I organized a community census awareness event before the pandemic to help educate people about the importance of the sentence, census. And I wrote letters to the editor in my local paper to show people the importance of the census. During the summer, I joined Common Cause Illinois' Leadership 6 internship program, where I worked on the issue of gerrymandering. Through that program, I continued to plan since census outreach, and I learned about different policy subject matters. My experience volunteering at Common Cause reflects experiences of many who decided to take action on important issues. Gun people are the future of our country. 
and organizations like Common Cause gave them the ability to take action on important issues that will affect them for years to come. For example, just recently, Common Cause Illinois invited me to give testimony at the Illinois Redistricting Committee about how to draw fair maps. During my testimony, I was able to share my opinion on this vital subject matter, and in the future, I plan to take lessons I have learned from Common Cause and continue to advocate for reform. Organizations like Common Cause give me hope for the future because I know that they are working day and night to ensure people are represented. I highly recommend anyone who is interested in taking action to get involved with Common Cause. In doing so, they will have their voice heard and have a significant impact on the future of our country. Happy, happy 50th um, Common Cause. My life without a car started in 2015. I had a medical event called an AVM and lost about half of my vision. So that means I have to get around other ways. So that involves buses, that involves friends, that involves a lot of walking. Uber, when I can swing that price, that's the reality for me and for a lot of other people. I do have a state ID. I've been able to maintain that. Um, it's important for a lot of other reasons, but I can understand how difficult that is to get now because I've had to do it. <laughs> it's a difficult situation when you don't have the freedom of being able to just drive. I know people work hourly jobs, that they don't have a choice to keep working, to pay their bills, that they can't take the time off. There are elderly Nebraskans who don't drive anymore. There are people who live in rural towns and are disabled whether they're part of our unhomed community, whether they're students. There's a lot of different reasons why people might not have a Nebraska ID that's up to date that are completely valid. It's how do you get to the location? And do you have the funds to pay for what's necessary? If they're not using their ID other than to go and vote, which is gonna be a lot of people, that is a poll tax. I think it will stop people from voting because someone's going to show up at the poll and not have their ID. And if we had any data that told us there was real fraud going on, it might be one thing, but we don't. We already go through a process of registering voters, making sure they are who they are, and that on election day, they're at the address that they said they were at. This doesn't add anything to that. It simply adds a barrier for the individual, but in terms of real security, this does nothing. And so requiring that these people get a state idea just for voting is kind of crazy. It seems like an easy process, but once life puts you in the circumstances that I've been put in, it's not as easy as it seems. The reality is we don't all live the same life. We don't all have the exact same experience. And we have to take that into account. We have to think that not everyone is going to be able to do what I do, to have the freedom I have. We should make sure that their voice is heard too, and that the laws we put in place don't cut them out, don't put them as a secondary citizen, but instead encourage them and protect them. Please welcome Common Cause President Karen Hobart Flynn. Good evening and thank you for joining our celebration tonight. When John Gardner founded Common Cause 50 years ago, he said everyone's organized but the people and now it's the citizens' turn. Several months later, 100,000 people joined Common Cause. Today we are more than 1.5 million people strong with Common Cause members in every state and congressional district. Our focus on a government that represents and serves the people's voice is a powerful vision that still endures today. Still, there is no one single issue to deliver a democracy that lives up to our ideals. Our work must be multifaceted and dynamic, meeting the challenges of the moment. A focus on transparency, accountability, high ethical standards, 
voting, citizen input and engagement, and reducing money's undue influence in the political process are key ingredients to a representative democracy. And at the same time, we must reckon with our country's founding with institutions and laws built on slavery. The legacy of racism and oppression continues to this day. In many ways, our country's systems were never envisioned or built for a multiracial participatory democracy. And that is why we must change those systems and those structures. Common Cause has a long history of passing reforms to help deliver on the promise of democracy. We organized and helped lead the fight to lower the voting age to 18. We literally pried open the halls of Congress and the state houses across the country to sunlight and transparency. We develop better ways for, to pay for campaigns so that our leaders are accountable to the people and not their biggest donors. We expanded access to the ballot so that every American can make their voice heard. We have fought cynical efforts of some politicians to silence voters, especially voters of color. We took on entrenched power to challenge gerrymandering where representatives choose their voters instead of voters choosing their representatives. And we have worked to promote access to free and open internet and protect an independent press. Putting country over party, we did our part to curb abuse of power by presidents who ran roughshod over the Constitution. We have much more work to do to stop it from happening again. We know that many in power are hostile to our solutions. They have tried to undermine, attack, or repeal some of those wins um, on democracy. And our country still faces significant barriers to a democracy that works for everyone. Racial inequity, mass incarceration, viral disinformation, vote suppression, racial and partisan gerrymandering, and a money and politics system that skews the playing field against the people. It is how we solve these challenges that gives Common Cause its mission. That's why it's so important that we build a political process that puts the people first and where our leaders are responsible to the people they represent. I am incredibly proud to be the first state leader to become president of Common Cause, where I bring my experience as executive director in Connecticut to every day of my work. It's where I learned that holding power accountable does not just take place on election day. It's something that you have to do 365 days a year. Special interests and their lobbyists figured that out long ago. But we too at Common Cause have learned those rules and strategies. We know that it is what happens after election day where citizen engagement and participation is just as vital. We also know that when people organize and take on power, they can and often do win. These fights are incredibly hard, and I'm not gonna lie to you, they can take multiple years to win. We know what it takes at Common Cause to fight these battles and win, and we have demonstrated it every year since our founding in cities and states across the country and in our nation's capital. Here's what I've learned in my 30 plus years of doing this work. Powerful interests and incumbents do not give up their power easily. Their power though relies on our compliance, our acquiescence, our apathy. They announce that there's nothing anyone can do to change their mind in an issue um, and that scares people into believing that they don't have any power and they can't have any agency. And it's just not true. I have seen across this country the tenacious power of everyday people who take on entrenched power and fight for democracy and win. When we organize together, when we fight, when we launch campaigns and demand democracy reforms, we can and do win. We need to remember that the people, the people have the power to make change. Because it's the people, to quote RBG, who are the font of governmental power. And that's what we need to remember to take on the challenges ahead. 
Speaking of challenges, now it is my honor to introduce somebody who's taken on many challenges. His name is Joe Goldman, and he is the recipient of this year's Common Cause President's Luminary Award, which is for individuals of prominence and brilliant achievement who have shown an extraordinary commitment to the pro-democracy agenda. Joe is the president of the Democracy Fund, and since 2014, the Democracy Fund has made grants of more than $150 million that support those working to strengthen our democracy through the pursuit of a vibrant and diverse public square, free and fair elections, accountable government, and a just and inclusive society. Joe understands the challenges that our system of politics faces at this moment. He has spoken out forcefully about how much we all need to do as we, in his words, work our way back from a democracy weakened by disinformation, rising white nationalism, and a breakdown of the institutions that hold up our republic. He has been involved in at least seven funding collaboratives to create systemic change, including a fund to support preparations for and responses to high-risk threats to the integrity of our elections, efforts to address equity in journalism, evolving challenges in the digital age and disinformation, and legal clinics to protect media freedom. Leading up to the 2020 election, Joe worked to bring in new resources to lean into supporting democracy um, at a really critical time in our history. He spent hundreds of hours recruiting new donors to the field, including major institutional investors, community-based donors, and also Family Foundation. Joe's work was essential to building and distributing resources to support nonpartisan work for free and fair elections, despite the many, many challenges we faced in 2020. We know the election of 2020 was not the end of our work. There is so much work ahead. As Joe has written, the next few years will be a make or break moment that will shape how the American people regard their democracy. Our government must demonstrate itself capable of reinvention, able to meet the challenges of this moment and responsive to the needs of the public at this fragile time. We are so grateful to you, Joe, for your tremendous leadership and service to our country. Congratulations and thank you. To Karen and everyone at Common Cause, I want to thank you for this award. It really is a great honor. As far as I'm concerned, the staff and volunteers of Common Cause are heroes. In communities across the country, you've kept the flame alive, rallying folks to stand up to the dangerous attacks that we've seen on our democracy. Truly, we are all in your debt. We all know just how precarious this moment is for our democracy. I want to promise you tonight that everyone at the Democracy Fund has your back. It's our job to make sure that champions like you have the resources you need to meet this historic moment. Thank you again for this honor. I look forward to continuing to be your partner, your supporter, and your greatest fan. Thank you so much. Please welcome Common Cause Illinois Advisory Board Member and longtime friend Corky Siegel for a musical performance of Counterintuitive.
Since 1970, Common Cause has served on the front lines of issues that have direct and lasting impacts on our lives, our communities, and our democracy. From the local level, to the halls of Congress, to the courts, Common Cause's people and programs together educate, advocate, and litigate to ensure that the voices of individuals are heard, counted, and centered in the work of government and our public leaders. Collectively, we work to hold power accountable, mobilize and engage citizenry, protect the public interest, and foster more inclusive and equitable communities. And we celebrate our 50-year milestone knowing that this work does not cease, and that common cause must continue to safeguard our democracy while attacks against it persist. We are still feeling, and reeling from, the reverberations born out of last year's national election. An election season that, as if a pandemic wasn't enough of a barrier, delivered blatant, egregious, and creative attempts by partisan actors to deny the fundamental right to vote to whole swaths of communities. At every turn, Common Cause marshaled resources and people across the country to help ensure citizens could vote safely and securely in an historic election. Unfortunately, we are seeing a widespread effort to roll back hard-fought election modernization reforms, so we must continue the fight. Less publicly, redistricting will soon be underway in each and every state, and the outcomes will drive policy choices that will be felt for a decade across the country impacting our communities and the fair and equitable representation that is so vital to our democracy. Redistricting happens every 10 years and is part of a process that starts with the census and then apportionment that determines the number of each state's representatives in Congress. Collectively, this process and your elected representative will determine how much money your state and local community will receive to pay for things like Medicaid, schools, hospitals, police and fire protection, roads and bridges, food security programs, and much, much more. Together, we can make the redistricting process fair, transparent, and free from partisanship, racial bias, and inequity. Because for too long, and in too many states, redistricting has been controlled by politicians in a process that is typically closed off exclusionary, inequitable, and driven only by the self-interests of those in power. Common Cause continues to lead broad-based coalition efforts to increase citizen participation in redistricting so that the perspectives and priorities of everyday people are the primary lens through which their communities are mapped and their inclusive representation ensured. Because in a democracy, power to lead flows from the people, and leaders have a commitment to represent the interests of all who reside in their districts. When partisan or prejudicial interests eclipse the greater good, Common Cause stands at the ready to combat abuses of power in whatever form they may take. More than ever, we are proud of our role as an agile and responsive organization capable of pivoting to meet the challenges of today, tomorrow, and the next 50 years. We are proud to call out injustice in whatever form it may take and proud to implement equitable and sustainable change. And we thank you for your support, engagement, and championship. Now it is my very great pleasure to introduce you to the recipient of the Chairwoman's Award for Transformational Leadership which recognizes an individual who has made a transformational contribution of time, talent, or treasure that will have a long-term impact on our pro-democracy agenda. Ning Mossberger Tang has a background in computer science and since 2006 has focused on conservation and environmental education, climate change mitigation, community organizing, and policy advocacy. Ning founded the Innovo Foundation and currently serves on several environmentally focused nonprofit boards, including the League of Conservation Voters. In the beginning of the pandemic, she founded Step Up in Crisis and raised millions of dollars for personal protective equipment for healthcare workers, low income communities, 
communities of color, and Native American reservations. She also founded the Blue Wave Postcard Movement, which runs voter education and turnout campaigns that reach millions of households. Ning has been a tireless advocate for strong democracy reform, including championing and engaging others in passage of the For the People Act. Ning inspires everyone who meets her as a tenacious leader who is transforming democracy and giving power back to the people. Thank you, Ning, for your energy, dedication, and courageous creativity on behalf of our democracy. Hi, I'm Ning Mossberger Tian. I'm very honored to receive the Common Cause Chairwoman's Award for Transformational Leadership for my work on democracy reform. Here you are. Common Cause 50 years anniversary. Very pretty, huh? I believe there are many people who are far more deserving of this award than I do. Countless people have dedicated their lives to bringing us peace and democracy. And I'm doing something very simple indeed. I'm asking folks to pay attention and warning them that democracy may be lost and our right to vote may be taken away if we are not paying attention. After the record high turnout in the 2020 election, lawmakers in 48 states have introduced at least 389 bills restricting voting access. 22 of these bills have already passed into law so far. This is undemocratic, unprecedented, and un-American. HR1, the Foreign People Act, is our best tool to fight back against that. HR1 will set a national baseline for voting access. It will establish automatic and online voter registration, universal vote by mail and early voting, and make election day a federal holiday. In addition, it will change campaign finance laws to reduce the influence of big money in politics. Limit partisan gerrymandering and create new ethics rules for federal office holders. HR1 will preempt many of the voter suppression laws already enacted in some states. It will protect the right to vote for all Americans. The right to vote is a cornerstone of American democracy. And democracy provides the foundation for us to address many issues we face. Actually, my top issue is climate which I have been working on for the past 15 years. One of the battles that we will surely lose if democracy is lost is climate. We need bold and consistent policies, prioritizing the health of the ordinary Americans and the future of our planet for the next three decades in order to address the climate crisis. Will any of these policies last if we prioritize the profit of a small minority? The answer is clearly a no. And that's why I fiercely and unapologetically advocate for the passage of HR1. I encourage you to join me regardless of what your top priorities are. Whether you care about economic equity, racial justice, gun control, immigration policies, or anything else, you need to care about the passage of HR1. Democracy unknown won't fix everything, but without democracy, everything will be lost. Common Cause has been a leader in protecting democracy. He has engaged in this fight for 50 long years. I'm lucky to have found a partner and ally such as Common Cause. Please join us. As Senator Schumer said, failure is not an option. Together, we will not fail. We will prevail and build a better future for ourselves, for our children, and for many more generations to come. Thank you so much.
Please welcome Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Jonathan Capehart. Good evening, everyone. It's time now for an important conversation, one on the state of democracy, our democracy. Please join me in welcoming two people on the front lines of the quest to protect it. Congressman Adam Schiff of California is chair of the House Intelligence Committee. He was the lead impeachment manager for Donald Trump's first impeachment in January 2020. And in two weeks, it'll be his birthday. So uh, early happy birthday and welcome, uh, Chairman Schiff. And everyone knows, everyone here knows Karen Hovert Flynn. She is the ninth president of Common Cause, a position she has held for the last five years in a career with Common Cause that spans more than 25 years. So welcome, President Flynn. Thank you, thank you very much. So Chairman Schiff, I'm gonna start with you. As I mentioned before, you led uh, the first impeachment of, of Trump, the investigation and, and the Senate trial into Trump's shakedown of a foreign government. In your closing speech uh, at that trial, you said, quote, if truth doesn't matter, we're lost. Nearly a, a year after that, uh, uh, the, the Capitol was uh, stormed by insurrectionists, incited by the former president and motivated by his big lie. What are you doing? What is Congress doing <coughs> to ensure that truth still matters in our democracy? Uh, Jonathan, thank you uh, for the question and, and thank you for moderating the discussion. And Karen, thank you for your phenomenal work. Uh, what a pleasure to join you. Uh, look, I think of all of the pernicious actions of the prior administration, among the most damaging was this relentless assault on the truth. Uh, the whole idea that we're all entitled to our own alternate facts, the truth isn't truth. Um, nothing, I think, is more deleterious to a democracy. If we don't have a shared understanding of the world as it is, uh, then how can we make rational choices about different policies, different agendas, different candidates for office, different choices we have to make as an electorate? It's impossible. Uh, and, and so I think this is fundamental, uh, is to reclaim uh, a sense of the truth again. And we see this debate being played out uh, with respect to the events of January 6th uh, and the fight over a commission that would establish the, the record, uh, what took place and what the, uh, the, the complicity was uh, of the prior administration, of people in Congress, uh, of those in the public. Uh, and, and so I think the fight for that commission, a nonpartisan, bipartisan commission, is part of uh, fleshing out the full facts and the truth. Um, we are trying to vigorously push back against those who would reinvent history. Uh, you see members of Congress already indulging in fanciful and dangerous thinking that this was nothing more than a tourist uh, visit. and. Uh, uh, and that uh, what they saw, what the world saw, they shouldn't believe their lying eyes. Uh, they should believe this revisionist history. So we're doing everything we can uh, to push back against this, um, but it's gonna be a common responsibility. Mm -hmm. And Karen, uh, the chairman was just talking about the attack on truth, but let's talk about the attack on voices that's happening in the states, a coordinated attack to silence people uh, through voter suppression, uh, racial and partisan gerrymandering to block fair representation. Um, and these tactics have been especially targeted to black and brown voters who showed up in record numbers in the presidential election, but also in the 2021 special Senate election in Georgia. So how is Common Cause fighting these efforts? Well, there's no doubt that there is a coordinated partisan assault on the freedom to vote, and it's happening in state houses across the country, aimed especially at black and brown voters. You know, we have seen a wave of vote suppression measures being introduced in state houses across the country in nearly every state, and they are predicated on Trump's big lie, the big lie that the election was stolen. You know, these are very serious challenges, but we're not backing down. First, we have brought policy expertise, grassroots people power and organizing to expand access to the ballot box and ensure that elected, um, elected leaders put people first. We have worked to pass groundbreaking solutions in states for more than a decade um, that take down barriers to participation and that give people their voice. And some of those are under assault. In addition, 
Um, last year in the 2020 election, we worked to expand access to, um, to the ballot by moving early in the primary season, um, automatic uh, voter registration, trying to get no excuse absentee voting, in-person safe voting, and absolutely expanded people's access. In the, um, in the election season, one of the things we do is we are leaders with a coalition of 200 different groups working to do election protection, nonpartisan election protection. So we have seen that black and brown voters are more likely to be confronted when they go to the polling place. So we recruit, train, and mobilize 46,000 nonpartisan volunteers just last year to let voters know what their rights are and, um, and that they can vote without obstruction or intimidation. We also have been pushing back at the poisonous uptick in viral disinformation that is, is designed to confuse voters and keep them away from voting. Because we did those things, we saw the highest voter turnout in 100 years. So we need to continue to push back against these measures that are showing up at the state level, but also Congress has a once in a generation opportunity to pass two critical pieces of legislation, the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The For the People Act is made up of common sense solutions that have passed with Republican, Democratic and independent support at the state level and also these measures can override many of the bad bills that are moving at the state level now. In addition, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act will stop future bad bills until they are federally reviewed in places with a record of racial discrimination and voting. We need to pass both of these bills in the next few months and also take on the challenge of ensuring that the, the Senate is not going to block access to this by moving Senate rules reform as well. Chairman Schiff, um, I got to get you talking about the incredible and unprecedented abuse of power um, that took place in the previous administration, both by the previous president, by, but also by others within the administration. We're talking about in, obstructing justice, as you well know, manipulating the DOJ, enriching himself and his businesses. What can Congress do to prevent this from ever happening again with any future president? Well, first of all, I, I think the existential need is to pass H.R. Uh, 1 and the John Lewis Act, as Karen was saying, since uh, voting is so foundational to all of these other protections and rights. Um, but there's a follow-on package uh, that I introduced last session that I'll be reintroducing. Uh, we're trying to vet it with the current administration uh, and uh, hoping we're not to receive the same uh, hostility that we received from the last administration about it but it would address a lot of these abuses. Uh, so the Protecting Our Democracy Act is what it's called. Uh, it would expedite the enforcement of congressional subpoenas uh, so that we can't have a future administration simply stonewall us uh, for years, uh, as the Trump administration did with Don McGahn, for example. Uh, it would strengthen penalties for violations of the Hatch Act when administration essentially dragoons federal workers into being an adjunct of their campaign. Uh, it would protect inspector generals uh, from being fired unless there is cause. Uh, it would protect against these temporary cabinet level appointments becoming essentially a revolving door, avoiding Senate confirmation uh, and a whole host of other mechanisms to, for example, enforce the emoluments clause so a president can enrich themselves uh, through use of their office. Um, I think that, you know, this package of reforms uh, is among the most comprehensive since uh, the Watergate, post-Watergate reforms. Um, but the most immediate priority is that H.R. 1 uh, and the John Lewis legislation, because um, what we are seeing, and, and this is, I think, the most terrifying, is in addition to these voter disenfranchisement laws that the Republican legislatures are passing on the basis of the big lie, they're also changing who gets to essentially review and audit an election after the fact? Who can challenge it? Uh, they're stripping powers away from independent secretaries of state and giving them to partisan legislatures. In a sense, what they're doing is preparing the ground such that in 2024, if we have another president who seeks to overturn the election, this time they may succeed. Uh, it's, I think, among the most grave threats to our democracy 
um, in my lifetime. And so uh, those fundamental reforms of H.R. 1, I think, are among the most important. Uh, Karen, Common Cause has been leading successful fights that take on power and entrench interests for more than 50 years and belated happy birthday, uh, Common Cause. But how have you? <laughs> How have you been able to do that? You know, for us, the winning formula really is people power, full stop. Engaging people in these fights matters. So we were, Common Cause was born during the Nixon administration and we helped move many of the solutions that responded to the Watergate scandal, like strong campaign finance reforms, freedom of information, and the Ethics in Government Act to protect against abuses of power. The, if you if you fast forward to the Trump era, you know many of the challenges that we've seen and that Congressman Schiff has talked about um, have engaged and mobilized people to become involved. We've seen him violate and exploit our democratic norms, values, institutions, and laws by flouting Congress and ignoring subpoenas, treating the Justice Department like his own personal law firm, profiting off the presidency by refusing to divest from his own businesses. He also worked to silence voters. He set up a phony um, voting integrity commission that was designed to target black and brown voters with laws and voter purges that would erase their votes. There was also um, you know, the census department trying to collect citizenship data with the goal of erasing millions of people from being counted in the census, which would mean less resources for their community. It also would mean, um, you know, not fair representation, not real representation. Even after Trump lost the election, we've seen so many of his followers decide that suppression and obstruction is the key to keeping power. And it's why protecting um, Democracy Act is so important and also engaging people in the fights to beat back against what we are seeing. It means we need to focus on structural racism that has been baked into our laws and governmental institutions and tackling the lies and disinformation so that, that voters are savvier about looking at the sources of information that they are reading about because they need to connect with the truth. Engaging people for these fights uh, is so important. Election day is just one step of being involved in a strong democracy. We know that you need to have savvy know-how, how to advocate in the halls of Congress and state houses that people need to build relationships, work in coalition. Um, and then also, we also know the, the, the biggest um, and strongest piece is having grassroots people pushing on the outside. You can be the best lobbyist in the world, but if you do not have grassroots pressure, you can't pass anything. Common Cause works on these issues and we stay engaged, win or lose. Sometimes these reforms take many years to pass because taking on power, that is what it takes. We also stick around to ensure that anything we win, that we implement it. We don't parachute in and out. So to me, organizing, speaking truth to power, knowing what you're talking about, and being willing to stick around to see it through, engaging grassroots activists, that is the winning formula. I'm going to keep the trains running on time and thank uh, Chairman, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff and Common Cause President Karen Hobart Flynn um, for this important conversation. Also, thank you to the audience and all of those who are watching for, for being here tonight and being a part of this conversation because you know, our democracy is at risk. This is an all hands on deck moment. And we are all, I assume, doing, doing our part to not only protect our nation, but to protect the, the system, the democratic, small d, democratic system that keeps things going. Our democracy is too important to do anything less. So happy birthday again, Chairman Schiff. Happy birthday, Common Cause. And thank you, Karen, for having me here. Thank you, um, Jonathan. It was an honor to have you join us. And Congress Congressman Schiff, thank you again for your leadership in Congress. Um, and we will be with you on Protecting Democracy Act. Well, thank you very much. Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our Executive Director of Common Cause California, Jonathan Metastein. I love the story of Jonathan's um, career path. 
He started as a graduate fellow uh, with Common Cause in California many years ago. Um, soon after, he joined Common Cause California State Advisory Board, where he served for 10 years. He became chair of that for five of those years and also is an attorney that worked with the ACLU and also Asian Americans Advancing Justice focused on, um, focused on voting rights. He also served on the Oakland Ethics Commission, where he worked to strengthen the public financing program in Oakland and then became our executive director of um, the California organization in 2020. So um, it's been great working with him. He's an amazing leader. And so take it away, Jonathan. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and thank you for your leadership. My name is Jonathan Menthestein. It's a pleasure to join you from California, where our small but mighty team here works on voting rights, redistricting reform, money and politics, reform and media and democracy issues, all in service of building a better and more inclusive democracy in the Golden State. It is my great privilege to award the John W. Gardner Award for Visionary Leadership to California Congressman Adam Schiff for his long track record of fighting for democratic values and working to defend our democratic institutions. Ten years ago, Congressman Schiff led the fight for the Daniel Pearl Freedom of the Press Act, meant to protect the freedom of the press overseas. The bill calls upon the State Department to identify and spotlight governments that seek to silence media opposition and violate press freedoms. Last year, Congressman Schiff introduced the Protecting Our Democracy Act, a comprehensive package of democratic reforms that he mentioned just moments ago. In addition to the thing, as Congressman Schiff noted in his earlier remarks, the bill would also prevent abuse of the presidential pardon power, help strengthen our system of checks and balances, prevent politicalization and corruption of the Department of Justice, and more. Today, Congressman Schiff is a strong supporter of the For the People Act, chairs the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and perhaps what he is best known for by many, he recently led the powerful and persuasive first impeachment effort against ex-president Donald Trump. We give the John W. Gardner Award, named for our founder, to an American leader whose work demonstrates exceptional foresight, creativity, and vision, and who holds power accountable, and who furthers a pro-democracy agenda in this country. I'm sure you'll agree that Congressman Schiff fits that bill. We're thrilled to honor Congressman Adam Schiff with Common Cause's John W. Gardner Award for Visionary Leadership. Congratulations, Congressman Schiff, and thank you. Congressman Schiff, if I can interrupt you, I, I believe um, you got muted at the beginning of your remarks. Okay, thank you. Well, <laughs> let me just uh, say again uh, how grateful I am uh, for this acknowledgement today and my thanks to all of you for the extraordinary work that you've done for now half a century and wishing you another half century of success. Uh, so vital to the health of our democracy. Uh, this is a precarious time uh, in the life of our country. A precarious time indeed, I think, for democracy all over the world. Uh, we, I think, took it uh, as a immutable law of nature that democracy would be ever expanding uh, around the world. We have, I think, since World War II, lived in a world in which uh, our freedoms were always growing. The freedom to associate with whom we would, to speak our peace, to love who we loved, uh, only to find that there was nothing inexorable about this. Uh, and indeed, uh, globally, I think we are at a dangerous inflection point where the autocrats have been on the rise now for much of the last decade. And year after year, we see fewer people living in freedom. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have seen, I think, a remarkable and dangerous turn uh, here at home, uh, where there have been attacks on the independence of the Justice Department, where the prior administration uh, would use the Depart department as a shield uh, to protect uh, those who would cover up or lie for the president and as a sword to go after the president's list of enemies. Uh, we have seen an administration use the office of the presidency to enrich itself uh, at the expense of the country. Uh, we have seen a president go after our watchdogs, our inspectors general, uh, and fire them for simply doing their job. 
uh, norm after norm has broken down. Uh, I think it probably came as a great shock to the last president just how vulnerable those guardrails really were, just how weak, in fact, those norms of office were. Uh, and so it falls on all of us, I think, to put uh, teeth back into those protections uh, to ensure that uh, our democracy uh, is put back on a solid foundation uh, after the last four years. Uh, and the work of Common Cause is vital to that enterprise. Um, so thank you for everything you do. Uh, thank you in particular for your championing of HR1. Um, this is, I think, existential to the health of our democracy. Uh, it is foundational. Um, and the idea that we would uh, turn the clock back and uh, usher in a new uh, generation of Jim Crow laws uh, is just anathema. Uh, but this is what we're up against. Uh, and I want to uh, once again underscore my, my great appreciation, uh, my thanks for this uh, beautiful accommodation, uh, and uh, happy birthday to Common Cause. Um, I'm slightly older than Common Cause, but I won't tell you how much older. Uh, and uh, very grateful for the acknowledgement uh, this afternoon. Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Okora. I'm a 22 year old graduate from Bowie State University and I am the small town girl with bigger dreams. And here today, I'm here to talk to you about my community involvement and just my life within politics. Um, where I started out, I started out at 18 years old and I worked for a political consulting group called Strategies for Change Group. And um, it was directed by Kilo Thompson and he had me work on different campaigns such as Angela Alsobrooks and Aisha Brayport. And from there, I work with numerous organizations such as Common Cause, Unite Incorporated, and then on to working with the National Urban League. And from there, I then ran for mayor of my own city, Glenida, Maryland. And just that experience within itself has taught me a lot. It's taught me that first, you know, running for mayor at 22 years old, I shocked my community. You know, not a lot of people see young people actually trying to be at the table. And it's important that we continue to break barriers and start to step to the table. Um, and just just within my community involvement, I just realized how much the community really didn't know what's going on within their own cities, within their state, within their country. And I think it's very important that we continue to incorporate community involvement, incorporate um, being involved within politics to younger people, and then also just being able to teach, teach others around us as well. Um, I just want to encourage everyone to, you know, to get involved, get involved, whether that's on the local level, on the state level or national level, learn something, then teach someone else. You know, there's always room for everyone at this table. Thank you. Please welcome Chairman Emeritus Robert Reich. Hi, everyone, and thank you. Common Cause has achieved a remarkable 50-year milestone, and we gather to honor its legacy and mission to ensure an accountable, equitable, inclusive, and representational government for everyone. As many of you know, my first job with Common Cause was during the summer of 1972, way back then, just two years after John Gardner founded the national organization. An enthusiastic member of Common Cause hired me to launch what would become Common Cause's first state chapter. It was in New Hampshire. Uh, months into my new role, with enormous enthusiasm, at least on my part, uh, Jack Conway, then Common Cause's president, requested that I meet him at headquarters in Washington, D.C. My excitement was huge, but it was soon quashed when he told me that Common Cause did not have state chapters and my early efforts were for naught. Not a very promising start to my near lifelong relationship with this extraordinary organization. Still, the Common Cause bug had bit and I stayed in touch with both Jack and his successor, David Cohen. I later met Fred Wertheimer, who suggested I join Common Cause's National Governing Board. Now, by that time, Richard Nixon had resigned. Rather than be impeached, Washington was buzzing with post-Watergate reforms, and Common Cause was playing a leading role in it all. I marveled at Fred's energy and enthusiasm, as well as his command of facts and legal arguments 
and I still do. Archibald Cox served as the chair of the National Governing Board then, navigating our way with his intellect and sharp moral compass. Later, while serving as Secretary of Labor under the Clinton administration, I had occasion to meet with Fred and Common Cause staffers, and I became aware of Common Cause's growing clout and effectiveness in Washington and across the country. I also became personally preoccupied with the issue of widening income inequality in America and the connection between increasing wealth moving into the hands of very few people and the escalating corruption of American democracy. In 2009, Common Cause President Bob Edgar asked if I would share the National Governing Board, and quite frankly, the experience was one of the most satisfying of my life. Bob's sudden and early death in 2013 was a tragedy to everyone who had the pleasure of knowing and working with him. Uh, then, in the run-up to the 2016 primaries, I took a leave of absence from my chair's responsibilities to help the Bernie Sanders campaign. As the 2018 midterms approached, I resigned rather than threaten Common Cause's nonpartisan charter and standing. Common Cause has accomplished an extraordinary amount over the last half century, but our celebration is tempered by ongoing turmoil and tumult in cities and communities across the country driven by prejudice, oppression, and hate, all perpetuated by those who feel that race-based and place-based malfeasance is their only path to power and authority. This circumstance is not new. Bad actors have populated our nation's government since its birth. And while it is partly the job of history to shout out a warning to those in the future, today I worry that not enough people are listening. Because what I find alarming is the determination of presumably intelligent people to intentionally deploy lies and falsehoods in an effort to manipulate democracy, almost beyond recognition, to feed their greed, egos, and their ambition. I believe the year 2020 brought us, as a country, as a democracy, as a people, to a demarcation point. Many of us looked upon our public leaders with frustrated dismay, and we wondered how to neuter their disinformation that was and remains so disruptive and even deadly. As a writer and commentator, I know words matter. Words are how thoughts and feelings are made manifest, and words combined with actions can achieve change and progress for some or drive exclusion and marginalization for others. So I find myself thinking about words and their meanings as they have evolved over time and as they've been deployed and misappropriated in response to heightened crises. In states across the country, for example, legislatures passing so-called election protection or election integrity bills that are designed barely designed efforts at voter suppression. They're aimed largely at voters from black and brown communities. This includes Texas, where a legislator recently defended that state's voter suppression bill as necessary to retain, in his words, the, quote, purity of the ballot box, unquote, while pleading ignorance of language that evoked Jim Crow policies of the past. History, history, is anyone listening I know that all of you here support Common Cause and its efforts to combat these bills and new laws, and I encourage you to engage with Common Cause's national headquarters or with advocates and partners at your state level, because the fight is far from over. In many ways, a new phase of it is just beginning. 2020 also delivered to our country a racial reckoning that remains unresolved from the deaths of people of color at the hands of police to the glaring racial inequities revealed in employment, education, health care, under the pandemic, to the racially based meddling in the census of the prior presidential administration. Not a single corner of black or brown lives in this country seems free from the injustice, degradation, and indig indignity of institutional and systemic racism. This country, this 
democracy, this republic, where power flows from us to those in elected office, where we have the absolute right to be represented by people who know our communities, who understand our needs, who will center us in their work and their advocacy, and who will hear our words. It is my fervent hope that the remainder of 2021 delivers a new beginning, a new foundation of equity in all forms, that from here on out we hold new truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal regardless of ability, race, gender, creed, identity, faith, zip code, place of birth, or financial resources. Democracy is not a zero-sum game. Fairness and justice know no boundaries, and we all deserve a place at the table. For the past 50 years, Common Cause has led successful efforts across diverse programs and projects to secure, protect, and defend our inalienable rights to opportunity, to self-determination, and yes, to speak words of dissent. For it's only our right to question our leaders. It is our responsibility to question them. And for the next 50 and counting, Common Cause will continue to serve as a nonpartisan, inclusive, and effective platform for such questions, along with solutions to keep those in check who would otherwise ride roughshod over our Constitution and our communities. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor past Common Cause heroes no longer with us, but whose spirits propel democracy's advocates and activists today. And let us recognize and celebrate those across the organization, the board, executive leadership, advocates, activists, and staff from headquarters to the field whose passion, dedication, and expertise across democracy's landscape defines and drives the collective ethos that is common cause today, today and every day that follows. And now I wish to introduce you to someone whose love of country seems to defy everything he and his family experienced. Under World War II, under early television's white dominance, under the fight for marriage equality, and today under the hostile atmosphere of prejudice against Asian Americans. His patriotism, his humor, and his undaunted efforts in service to justice, equity, and inclusion have earned him the respect of millions. I am so pleased to present the John W. Gardner Award from Common Cause to Mr. George Takei. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Common Cause, for this prestigious award. As one who has experienced the pain of racism under our democracy, I wish to share this recognition with all who are living with fear, marginalization, and exclusion based on the color of their skin or place of birth. For a democracy cannot exist while communities are oppressed and while citizens' rights are denied. John Gardner understood this. I also share this recognition with those who continue to move forward boldly and bravely in order to achieve justice, inclusion, and caring across our collective humanity. We are all exhausted. We are weary of seeing ourselves as victims in new stories when our stories are not new, but generations of families and friends before us still show us the way with a legacy of grit and determination. We cannot undo the horrors of our past, but we can commit to not perpetuating injustice in all its forms. 
we can know the names and honor the lives of those who died at the hands of racism and violence. And as hard as the work is, together and hopefully, we can foster a global community where our differences make us stronger and where liberties and opportunities are secured fairly, equitably, and unimpeded by hate and ignorance. This is what democracy means to me. Thank you. My name is Elisa Canty and I'm the National Director of Youth Programs at Common Cause. Hi, my name is Fernicia Moore and I'm the Youth Programs Coordinator at Common Cause. One of my favorite parts of traveling, whether it's in my home state of North Carolina, across the country or abroad, is the murals in the street art that I see. It is always clear that behind every mural, there is someone trying to get their voice out to the world or highlight a current issue they see in their community. This global phenomenon is also known as artivism. It bridges the creative power of art with the strategic design of activism to bring forth social transformation. Artivism takes art beyond museums and galleries and activism beyond demonstrations in state houses, providing a level of adaptability and access that thrives in our contemporary society. This year, our goal is to uplift youth voices and perspectives on democracy issues through their creativity. With all of the difficulties we all experienced over the past year, we want to celebrate young people in their drive and motivation to help us create a better democracy. Whether they are passionate about redistricting, voting rights, criminal justice reform, media and democracy, campaign finance, fair courts, or voting age advocacy, we not only want to celebrate the 50th anniversaries of Common Cause and the 26th Amendment, but we also want to celebrate young people and their voice. That's why we are launching the My Voice, My Art, Our Cause, an art competition focused on the role of artivism and democracy reform. The official launch will be on July 1st, the anniversary of the 26th Amendment, which Common Cause was one of the organizations advocating for its passage. Submissions will be accepted through September 30th. For more information and updates, sign up at commoncause.org slash artivism or follow the Common Cause Student Action Alliance on social media. Democracy looks like collaboration, cooperation, and compromise to bring an unexpected result. Something different. Please welcome back Common Cause President Karen Hobart Flynn. Hey everyone, this has been such a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we close, I wanna take an opportunity to honor one final person. 50 years is a milestone that warrants deep reflection about what matters most, what's working, and where are the places we need to take stock. John Gardner wrote about renewal and the importance of it to individuals in society. But renewal isn't always about change. It's also remembering the values and assessing if we are living up to them and renewing our commitment to them. After more than a year of a pandemic of isolation for many of us when Zoom and FaceTime had to pass for personal connection, many of us found ourselves appreciating the people who keep us connected to our values and help us remember who we are. For more than 42 years, <clears throat> and hopefully for a few more, one person has kept our staff connected to John Gardner and his vision, 
In part, she shared office space on the sixth floor of 2030 M Street. And she has been the voice on the other end of a call to common cause, ready to brighten our members' day, help them understand our issues, help them solve problems, accept a donation, or direct new donors to the right staff. If you are one of our donors who's been around, you already know Vernell Grissom. And if you don't, I'd like to share a little bit more about her. Vernell is Common Cause's longest tenured employee. And over the past 42 years, she has touched so many lives, including my own. Vernell has mentored hundreds of staff. She has talked with thousands and thousands of Common Cause members. And she has helped guide Common Cause through years of both turmoil and uncertainty, as well as joy and a lot of victories. Vernell is also our connection, not only to our members, but to John Gardner, who she admired and knew so well, as she shares stories with all of us about his leadership. She has embodied the belief that each of us has something important to say and do in this life. And that was the foundation of everything John Gardner believed. And she has shown us what a privilege it is to have the opportunity to do this work, not because it was John Gardner's vision, but because she knows and lives the same truth he did, that we must seize opportunities to do good and to fight for people's voice in their democracy. Vernell Grissom, we know you prefer not to have the spotlight on you, but please understand that you, like John Gardner, have reached that rare place in life that means, you know, not that this is not just about you, it's about how you have helped so many of us to keep the spirit of John Gardner's ideas alive and inspire us with your wisdom. So for honoring her friend, John Gardner's vision, and sharing her beliefs with so many of us at Common Cause, and by bringing the spirit of the mission to work every day in the way she spoke to donors and, and staff and being who she is, we wanna make these two icons of Common Cause have a legacy to connect them well into Common Cause's future. So tonight I wanna announce that we will be naming our conference center in our national office, the Gardner Grissom Conference Center, which will reflect, will have signs on the glass doors and new art and images that reflect the values that connect John Gardner and Vernell Grissom, and that will continue to connect Common Cause to this legacy friendship and inspiration and what it means to us in our workday every day. So Vernell, thank you for all you do for Common Cause staff, Common Cause members and activists each day. That brings me to three final thank yous. I wanna thank our sponsors who have supported us and the staff who have pulled this terrific virtual event together, LaShonda Jackson, Hannah Smolar, Lois Greer, Josh and Stephanie from Berger Hirschberg Strategies, and many of our staff in development, communications, and campaigns team. Too numerous for me to name, but you all are amazing. I wanna thank everyone who contributed their time and their words to this event. Bob Reich, um, Corky Siegel, and thank you all this evening for your steadfast support. The truth is you are all part of Common Cause. We are here today because of the vision and mission of so many of you that came before us who built the path forward for so many of our victories. And together we face real challenges, but also opportunities for the next 50 years. John Gardner's words five decades ago in his book in Common Cause are as true today as they were back then. He spoke with clarity about what we share is a concern for the public interest. We share a recognition that no one of us will prosper for long if community deteriorates. If the nation fails, we all fail. And we share the conviction that as citizens, we have every right to raise hell when we see injustice done or the public interest betrayed or the public process corrupted. I believe that democracy is resilient, but we have a lot of work to do to ensure that all people are part of it especially those who have not only been left out, but silenced and excluded. We need to take down those barriers. And that is our common cause. You are all part of that mission. And as long as we work together, I have every confidence we can deliver on our democracy's promise with freedom and equal justice for all. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll join us for the after party and have a great evening.